Okay, Sheikh, good evening. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, very warm welcome to another edition on a Saturday evening. I think uh, nothing can be better than a Saturday evening for you to listen to an outstanding talk uh, organized this evening, Toolbox for Emotional Coping. Before I come and uh, formally uh, introduce the chairperson and also the speaker for the day will be the chairperson, the format. And after setting the contacts, uh, uh, the speaker will speak for 30 minutes. As usual, if you have any question, please send your question by WhatsApp number and we'll be happy to collect them and place it before the speaker and the chairperson. The question could be addressed to any one of them and they'll be uh, eager to respond to all your questions. Only make sure the question relating to only toolbox, emotional work, coping, something relevant to the woman empowerment and the topic what we are discussing this evening. Uh, before I do that, uh, let me have the privilege of uh, briefly telling you what's happening in MMA in the next few days so that uh, uh, I know you are getting so many emails from us and some of them honestly concern the day. MMA, so many emails, I don't read them. So I, that's why I thought I'll take uh, this time to take a minute to tell you what's happening in MMA so that you don't miss some of the outstanding programs we are curating and bringing to you exclusively for you. And uh, on Monday, the 21st of Feb, we have the Art of Management. We started a new series uh, uh, exclusively in Tamil. It's very popular. There's lots of people from all of our chapters watch this in big number. It's really, really interesting to do a total program in Tamil. And we have Pulavan Indiran. Uh, he'll be talking to us, uh, Satya Academy Award winner. And he'll be talking to us on uh, the subject Art of Management. Uh, please do come. It's happening live at the MMA Management Center uh, with IT being served at 5.15. Then on Wednesday, the 23rd of Feb, we have an event on Entrepreneurship, uh, this is for the member of Pondicherry. Uh, Mr. Mananadal is going to be talking to the chairman of Pondicherry chapter in Manatek. And uh, I also want the speaker talking about empowering entrepreneurship and how technology can change. Then on the uh, Thursday, 24th Feb, we have uh, overcoming personal challenges of professional growth. Uh, we have Meena Chabria. She is uh, Associate Vice President of uh, Brand Alliance and PVR Cinema. PVR Cinema, you have all 100 screens around uh, India and how she is managing and how she is able to Race to that uh, position, what she is there today, and what are the obstacles she is she's going to be sharing with us. Then we have an interesting, very interesting event on 3rd of, uh, 3rd of March, that is Year to Speak series. Kitty Ramagopal is going to be talking to us, he's a global head of Android uh, partner technology and engineering. He's going to be telling us, and he's going to be in conversation with uh, uh, the Dean of Great Lake Institute of Management, uh, uh, and he'll be in conversation on the subject. How a global uh, giant like Google is able to really make Android a very powerful tool. Um, Mr. Ram Gobal is in, uh, on a short visit to Chennai. Uh, we thought we'll, you know, it'll be nice if you come and speak to a member, which is kindly agreed. Uh, please don't miss to listen to Dr. Ram Gobal. Again, this event happening live at MAM Management Center. Then on the 8th of, on the 3rd of March, we have another interesting event, uh, Code of Wages and its implication, uh, Code on Wages and Implication, Employee and Employer uh, Perspective. You all know the Code of Wages has been thing, and we strongly believe that rule of law to be enforced and our members should really follow the rules and regulation without any deviation. And that's why we are bringing how the implication is going to impact you. And we have got some outstanding uh, panelists. Uh, Sai Prasad, senior advocate, will be setting the context. And we have outstanding panelists. Uh, Anil Kaushik, Soundarajan is uh, is the state president of CITU because we also part, got a trade union representative to share their perspective. Then Ravichandran, senior general manager HR, Matthew Gonashilan, uh, secretary of NAPM Madras chapter. And, Amal Das, uh, uh, he will be director of HR Temple. They'll be talking to us to tell you what exactly the law means to you and how it's going to impact your salary bill and how you're going to be in gratuity, how to be paid five years, one year. So many rules are going to be discussed, not to be missed. Again, happening live at MAM Madden Center. 16th, we have a goal setting for high performance in your work. Uh, then again, on Thursday, 22nd, we have, please block your diary. We have an outstanding conclave at Lila Palace. Uh, Ukraine uh, crisis is a global focus moving back to Europe. You know, this topic is discussed in detail. We have some outstanding panelists. Kanwal Sibal is former foreign secretary of the government of India. General Narsiman uh, is a member of the National Security Advisory Board. Professor Karl Masala is uh, on the US war, is, is from the German, uh, uh, one of the universities, and also serves on uh, one of the war training students in Germany. Tara Kataria is a former National Security Council secretary and former senior fellow of USIP. Nandan Unikishan is a senior fellow of uh, uh, ORF, then Stanley Johnny is the international affair editor of the Hindu. So we have a very fantastic uh, lineup of speakers. Uh, only one more thing I want to add to you. We have two more flagship events which are going to be there and not to be missed. Our annual convention is happening on the 12th of March, Saturday. Betting on the future, how India can make this decade its own. I'll take another minute so that a couple of people who are in the queue can 
second it's coming up now i think uh, should reach 100 soon i suppose then uh, the theme of the convention is betting on the future how india can make this decade its own again we have outstanding uh, speakers uh, basket but uh, director Tata Sons, uh, Anant Christian CTO Tata Consulting Services, Kamakori is the director of IIT Madras, Shivan Shukupta, senior partner McKenzie, Prashant Varshu, senior strategy officer Ramco, Ashok is the former chairman of IOC and also present CEO of RLPL, uh, Govind, their partner Egon uh, Zender, Satinarayana Mehta is a senior general manager HR, global head of food policies and talent from TCS, then Makesh, uh, professor of IIT Madras, then Velu Swami is a chief global product officer. Development Automated Division of Mahindra Well City, Kanyapan Managing Director of Wapco, Titi Ram Gobal is again you all know. Navi Noni is Managing Director of McKinsey and Company. We, have got, we are lined up some fantastic speakers, including Vivek Subramaniam, he is a co founder, executive director of uh, Port Energy, uh, one of the funds who has really promoted the uh, solar power. Bridler Ramesh is CEO of Sundaram Foundation, and SSV Ramkumar, Director of RD Firm, Indian Oil uh, Corporation Limited, New Delhi. Then another event which you should not to be missed event is our. MMA Women Convention, and we have our uh, chairperson of MMA Women Convention is here, uh, the committee, and they are putting together some outstanding convention. The theme of the convention in this area is Marching Ahead, Aspiring Change, and Inspiring Mankind. This is happening on 26th of March, 1920. Both the programs are paid programs. Uh, so you will get a circular, very small nominal amount, so that we should regulate the numbers because our auditorium can take only about 250 300 people. With the proper distancing protocols. <clears throat> That's the reason. So, with this, I'll stop. I think enough. We're taken. I've taken my allotted time. Now, coming to today's uh, topic, uh, which is very, very interesting, which we, I am personally looking forward to listening to Dr. Pitika Chari after a long time. And it's always inspiring to move with her. I worked closely with her when she was part of the MA Managing Committee. Toolbox for emotional coping. And uh, she's going to share with us. And to share this session, we have Dr. Ranjini Manian, uh, who is also a member of the MMA Managing Committee. And uh, let me have the privilege of introducing Dr. Ranjini Manian. Dr. Ranjini Manian uh, spent over two decades as an entrepreneur, ambassador, author, philanthropist, connecting global citizens to India. She founded the Global Adjustments. Dr. Ranjini served on Harvard Women's Leadership Board and uh, authored a number of books. And the re recent one, which I also had the opportunity to read, is The Champion Woman Truth. I saw not to be missed. And I suggest everyone to read this book. She is currently the founder chair of Global Adjustment Foundation, uh, where the mission is to empower women. And as over 2 lakhs people's lives have been impacted the last five years, that's a phenomenal number. And uh, she serves as advisory board member of Apollo Hospitals. And she studies the psychology and uh, the French literature from Bombay University and the uh, University in Paris. She is uh, three decades of mindfulness practitioner and a coach. Uh, very warm welcome to you, Ranjini. It's indeed a pleasure to have you with us this evening. And Ranjini, also a member of the Managing Committee, shares the MMA Women's uh, Managers from which present some outstanding events. Uh, she has been a great supporter of MMA. Now, over to Ranjini to set the context and also introduce the speaker. Ranjini Manian. You are unmuted. Thank you very much, Group Captain. Uh, it's always a privilege to come back and do things at MMA. And especially when it's with a friend and a person that I greatly admire, like Dr. Pratika Chari. Ever since I came to move from Bombay to Chennai and I set up my home here, I have my paths have crossed hers here and there. And from a distance, I've admired her and then closely also interacted with her. I just wanted to set the context of today's topic because it's such an important topic, isn't it? And whether it's a big or small, a global or a personal reason, the challenges that are coming today into our life are causing us a little bit more stress. Don't you agree, all of you who have taken the time on a Saturday evening to bring us all together here? And what is happening is it is becoming a part of the fabric of our days. A little bit of stress, a little bit of emotional turmoil, a little ups and downs. The pandemic, the economic crisis, the uncertainty of it all, it's just giving us a little bit of trouble or a little bit stretching our lives beyond the limit. Stress has become sort of a chronic interference, I would say almost. And, and the person to demystify this and to give us an emotional toolbox, no one better than Dr. Preeti Kachari, who's not only a neurosurgeon, but also a neurophysician. And I know how important that combination is and how rare it is my own husband had a brain surgery, and he had to run to the surgeon to actually do the surgery to the physician to actually get 
the feeling of wellness again. And so I think it's important that for any one of us who might be struggling in today's anxious world, maybe we can look at these time-tested practical skills that Dr. Chari will give us to get over maybe frustration, a little anger, a little stress, a little fear, and just bear enough strength to go through the storm. And that's what I'm hoping to hear from her. I think this session is going to help us cope more effectively because the word cope is beautiful. It helps, it's a positive word, right? Cope more effectively with the irritations of daily life. Even at that level, we need to cope. And then be at our best under stressful situations. That also we need to be able to handle. And then we have to recover quickly, right? When there's a crisis or, or a situation that needs us to bounce back resiliently. And finally, I think this session will improve relationships between people. And as we become more and more patient, applying the toolbox that dear Dr. Preetika Chari will share with us. And with that, I thank you all. And I hope that you take away a lot of things from it. Stay in touch and ask questions at the end and take advantage of having Dr. Preetika Chari with us. Thank you, Dr. Preetika Chari. Uh, will you enable screen sharing for me? Yes, please. Screen share, please. Both. Yeah, I'll change it. You know, yeah. no, I've got it, I think. Yeah. So good evening to all of you. And my association with MMA has been over a very long time, very intimately during in the initial stages for nearly eight, 10 years. But after that, little bit less uh, interaction. And I want to thank MMA. I want to thank group captain. I want to thank Maitali for inviting me to be the speaker for today. And of course, I have to thank Ranjini for stepping in when Maitali couldn't make it because she's been unwell. I hope you get well soon, Maitali the message will come, come to you through group captain, I think. So what we're going to talk about today is I'm going to give you a little bit of background as to why emotions and emotional coping can influence our lives. And for that, you need to understand a little bit about what happens in the brain when we are faced with our feelings, our emotions, our thoughts, and various bodily painful conditions. So there is something known as social feeling, which is very important for us to be well, for our well-being, because man is a social animal. We were not created to live by ourselves in isolation. And though the pandemic has actually pushed us into an unreal situation like that, social feelings are very, very important for well-being. And this comes from various influences in our life. Affiliation is when we associate with somebody who is doing something similar to us. When we are children, our parents influence the way we look at society, the way we move with others. Somewhere along the way, the parent, teacher, society, there are moral sentiments which we learn and absorb and which gets into our belief system. Now, a lot of this is influenced by several neurotransmitters which influence our mood. In today's world, our social feelings are being influenced a great deal by social media. Your Instagram, Facebook, all of this is playing a very vital role in the way we behave as social beings. Now, social feelings involve emotional communication. And when people have psychiatric conditions, these social feelings get altered or they go, they run amok and things change in the way they behave in society. But what is more important and more relevant to what we are going to discuss today is personal and interpersonal stress. Now, as Ranjini told us a little earlier, the uncertainty, the unpredictability, and 
there is this feeling of, I'm not sure if I'm enough. I'm not sure if I am doing the right thing. I'm not sure if I'm thinking the right way about certain people, about certain situations. This is causing a lot of interference, as she, I like that word, interference, as she called it, in the way we are able to be emotionally stable during the day, which we need. And the language. Linguistics is very important. The language of self-talk, the language we use with each other can also influence social feelings tremendously. And though in communication, we always say that the verbal communication is only a small bit, the body language is much more and our, just our expression, our attitude. Now for all of that, unless you are in an emotionally stable state, all of that is going to be influenced by whatever it is you're going through. And so this whole bundle is what is needed for our well-being. There is a connection between our five senses, the brain and the rational brain, which is the prefrontal cortex, and the emotional brain or what is called as the limbic system. Now, this front portion is the rational brain. The limbic system is this blue and orange area. And also there are a lot of deeper connections. Now, the importance of these two areas goes back to our evolution. See, the earliest brain that we had, which is represented by this lower portion called the brain stem, is what is called as the reptilian brain. It's a survival brain. All it does is performs all the survival functions. It's very important even in the human in spite of this evolution, because that is what does all the automatic functions in our body. You're not aware of your blood pressure, your pulse, your temperature, all those things go on. And so it's very important for it to maintain what is called as homeostasis or a stable state in the body for all the functions to keep doing what they have to do the way it has to be done. But the limbic system can influence this survival brain. And the limbic system is the emotional brain. The outer brain is a new cortex or a much later developed where speech, language, rationalization, intellectualization, all of that came. So actually when we speak about emotion, it is not an isolated uh, ha thing happening in one part of the brain. Now all of these parts of the brain participate in the sensory neural emotion connection. So when I see something, when I hear something, when I taste something, when I smell something, when I touch something, all of these are connected to my emotional state and it is influenced by my cognition and my rational brain as well. So it's a very complex system. And so we cannot really separate them out. And that is why we say there is a tremendous link between the spirit, mind, brain, body, immune system, and the endocrine system, which is the glandular system. Don't get worried by this confusing diagram. It's just to emphasize to you that many parts of the brain take part in the sensory neural emotion connection. There is a small part of the brain called the insula, which is the feeling side of emotions. So it's responsible for our very complex internal sensations or feelings like anger, sadness, elation, disgust, sexual arousal, anxiety. Also, it is responsible for some bodily sensations. So when you, what you will have to notice is the close relationship between emotion and our bodily sensations. So visceral sensations like pain, temperature, fatigue, itch, pressure, and tension are linked to the emotional area. It's all together in one small area called the ins insula. Now, the importance of this is that physical pain and emotional pain are processed very similarly in the brain. And so if you have an emotional disturbance, you can have a pain in part of your body. We all know that sometimes itching is something that is, there's no clear reason for the itching, but you're going through an emotional stress. And you'll find that conditions like psoriasis, which have a lot of itching in it, 
appear because of an emotional stress. And when the emotional stress clears, the psoriasis in the skin clears. So the body is a reflection of many of our emotions. And so there are bodily locations of various emotions in, our, in the physical body. Now, for instance, if you look at the perception of fear, it can happen in two ways. Now, there is an emotional stimulus. You see a snake. There is a perception of fear. I am afraid that of the snake because I know it is something to fear. That can cause a physiological reaction in your skin where you get goose, fle goose flesh, they call it piloerection. Your heart rate will go up, your breathing will go up, and it directly goes and works on the rational brain as a perception of fear. Another way in which it can work is it goes first to your emotional brain or what is called as a structure they call the amygdala, which is the fear center. It is the rage center. It is the center for many, many emotions. And then you have an implicit memory of some time ago, you learned that snakes are dangerous. And so then it processes and says, a snake is something to be afraid of. And that stimulates the physiological reaction. Now, when we are faced with a challenge, what happens is our first response is not a response. It's a reaction at the level of the amygdala. Then the amygdala sends impulses. The outer perception of pain or fear or whatever it is comes to the amygdala. It also goes to a structure called the thalamus and from there to the front of the brain, which is the rational brain. So the amygdala is the first response. The upper brain or the prefrontal cortex response is a response. It's a proactive response. The amygdala is a reactive response. So the proactive response will override the reactive response and say, look, you're only looking at the snake. It is not biting you, so don't be afraid. Or it's only a picture of a snake. So there is no need. Yes, snakes are dangerous, but right now, it is not going to cause you any harm. So this is called, sometimes what happens is the rational brain doesn't get a chance to override the amygdala. And this is called amygdala hijacking. So we start having unreasonable fears and we live with those fears without allowing our rational brain to bring it into some kind of meaning or sense. So there's a threat. There's a sensory system through which you perceive the threat, there's fear in the amygdala, you have a fear response, you get into fear behavior and physiological response. There is also a defensive survival circuit. So you activate that, which also talks to the amygdala, and then you build up your defenses. Now, if there's a fire in the room, suddenly, we don't wait for the rational brain to say, get up and run. The primitive brain and the amygdala will say, get up and run. Then you will see where do I run, how do I run, which door should I go by, should I take somebody with me, should I go alone, all that comes afterwards. So the role of the amygdala, role of the reactive brain and the primitive brain is to keep us safe. That is the primary function of the brain. The brain is meant to keep you comfortable and keep you safe. So this is the reason why when you want to challenge yourself, we say you come out of your comfort zone. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting there fearing everything around you and not become your real true self. So the emotional circuit comes from the stimulus to the thalamus, thalamus to the amygdala. Amygdala goes to other parts of the brain. It goes to the front of the brain and it activates the automatic nervous system. It activates the emotional response it activates the glandular system. So you'll see that an emotional circuit is so complex. Now, it has been shown that there are parts of the brain, you just, when you empathize with an emotional scene, say you're looking at a movie and they show us something very pathetic on the movie and you're empathizing with that scene. There are areas of your brain, which in the parietal cortex, the part of the insula, which I told you, another part in the lower brain, all of these get activated. And also in the 
limbic system or the emotional brain. There are areas and also in the primitive brain. So just looking and empathizing itself can create a lot of responses in the brain. And when you're very proud, uh, my team achieved, my team won. There are different parts of the brain which get activated, mainly the rational brain because it reasons and says, we've done this. Then there is the part of this part of the brain is the, is got a sensory system, the hearing system. And the medial prefrontal cortex is very important for a sense of achievement. Then when you see an emotionally charged scene, say the cricket team, they won or they, the, they did not, they overcame the rival team or the rival team won, whatever it is. You look at the number of areas in the brain which get activated. So the whole process of experiencing emotions is pretty complex. And we know that emotions and cognition can influence pain. And pain in turn can influence fatigue, anxiety, can create psychiatric disorders like anxiety, depression, can cause irritability, can cause relationship difficulties. All these are cognitive and emotional effects of pain. So the two are intimately related in a, a vice versa kind of fashion. When Remember that you can emotionally modulate pain and there is a brain circuit for that. So when that brain circuit is activated, that is where the toolbox comes into play. When you put a toolbox into action, you'll find that you can increase or decrease the experience of the pain and the emotion being experienced. And like we showed, empathy for another person's pain can increase your own pain. So when you can reduce pain by distraction, you'll find that the emotional pain can be more bearable. So that is where we are bringing in the toolbox. Also, if you just anticipate that you're going to feel better, that you're going to get relief, that also activates what is called the opioid system in the brain, which is the natural painkiller system of the brain. So when we do things which look apparently uh, unconnected, external things, which can influence the way the brain responds to pain, you can reduce both emotional and physical pain. Now, there are many ways in which we respond when we are undergoing a challenge, an emotional challenge or a physical challenge. One, we are in a problem solving mode and we have the efficiency to solve the problem. Otherwise, we get into a just a coping mode. We are able to emotionally cope with it. We still don't have the solution to the problem. We don't know yet how to resolve the problem. We can get into a hedonic disengagement mode where the problem solving thing doesn't exist at all. I'm just disengaged from it, but I'll cope with whatever mechanisms I have in hand. Another is you pretend the problem is not there at all. Then the other one, which is the worst form, which we all, many of us succumb to is we, are, we don't attempt to solve the problem and we become totally helpless. We have no efficiency. Or you cope in a negative way, which is also not good because you worsen the pain, you worsen the situation. And the other method is that you get preoccupied with the problem. That becomes your be all end all for all your activities. So these are many ways in which we respond when we are faced with a challenge. It has been shown with heat maps, thermal maps, that emotions can get trapped in the body. And the brighter the color is, the more energetic is that emotion being in the body. You look at happiness. It is a high energy uh, emotion and it involves the whole body and makes you feel really good. Look at sadness. The, it's a very low energy feeling. Look at love. How much energy it has. Look at depression. It's again a very low energy. This has been established and proven scientifically that emotions can get trapped in the body in various parts of our body, which is why in some mindfulness exercises, in some uh, meditation exercises, they say when you're meditating, if you are thinking about a pain, see where the pain appears in your body. So when you think about it, sometimes you can isolate the pain in your body. 
So there are many ways in which we cope emotionally. One, we walk away. Or we say, it's okay, I can manage. Of course, we might have a toolbox, which I'm going to tell you. We feel that everything is safe now, it doesn't matter. We ask for help. Or we change the way we talk about it. Or we just take deep breaths, or we laugh, or we spend some quiet time, or we just listen to advice from somebody, or we distance ourselves from the problem. These are all many ways in which we deal, uh, cope emotionally. There are tons and tons of books which tell you master your emotions and all that. And the, the, the Amazon is full of books like this. But if we can really understand the problem, the answer itself is there. It will come out of the problem. It is not separate from the problem. And that is what we do when we access a toolbox. So now what is this toolbox? There are four things that we work with for resilience. One is it has been shown that when you physically move your body, when you're undergoing an emotional stress, you can change the state of your emotion. Your emotional state can be changed. The second is when you play with your emotions by being creative, by diverting it and uh, you know applying it in some other activity, you can cope with an emotion. When you get it out, give vent to it, just uh, let off steam. That is another way of, in which to cope with the emotion. Fourth method is to just relax. So now there are multiple things that you can do. But this is not the toolbox that I'm going to be suggesting to you. Now, just as an example of movement, you can do any form of exercise, jumping jacks, go for a walk, dance, jump rope, do whatever you want, go for a bike ride. Playing, you can play an instrument, you can paint, you can do some craft, you can, uh, you can uh, sing, you can uh, sing loudly, you can you know, work on creating something beautiful. Getting it out, many people, there are certain, there are certain places in Japan where they keep a lot of porcelain plates. You can pay, go there, and if you're angry with your boss, put a picture of your boss there and throw the plate against it and break it. So you can gather stuff to smash and smash. Some people punch a bag. Some people, you know, scream. The scream therapy is a therapy, actually. There, so there are many ways in which you can give vent to your emotion. You can get it out. The other is rel relaxation. Meditation, creative visualization, playing with your pet, cuddling with a child, meditating, breathe deeply. All of these are ways to relax. Now, you have to remember, because I told you that emotions can be affecting in the body, it is possible to actually trap painful emotions in our muscles. And you'll find sometimes that people who are depressed will complain of aches and pains. They'll say, I have generalized body ache. This is because they are trapping their emotions in their muscles. And is emotional muscle memory real? We don't know. But though we don't have very clear scientific proof of this, when you undergo a massage, when you undergo osteopathic treatment of a fascial release, you start feeling better. Your emotions start feeling better. So it is believed that emotional muscle memory is real. Now, the first thing that we have to do when we want to set up an emotional toolbox is to have a safe area where we can give vent to some of the coping mechanisms and take advantage of that. This whole process actually started when it was for special children who were hyperactive, who were angry, who were violent and all that to help them, help the teachers and the parents to manage these children. So in the kindergarten or in the, in the classroom, they have a rest area. It will be a blue zone. The child will know that if she, he or she wants to rest, she, he or she can go to the blue zone. The green zone is something where they can find an activity to do. If they are very agitated, very hyperactive, the yellow zone is somewhere when you sit them, there will be things available to slow them down. And the red zone is also something where you they're doing something so violent or so distressing that it has to stop. So sometimes the child himself will choose to go to these zones or 
the parent or teacher will take them and put them in these zones within the classroom. So we have to mimic this whole thing when we as adults want to cope. There are rooms called snow zillion rooms. Now these rooms are multi-sensory environments. In these rooms, there will be some pleasant smells which you can manipulate, sounds you can manipulate. You can watch these things slowly moving up and down, which relaxes you. There will be play of colors. There'll be play of lights. So what you need to do is find in your own home a nook or a small area and create your own emotional toolbox where you want to keep your emotional toolbox. So you could set up something like this. It could be in your veranda. It could be something just which makes you feel really good and comfortable and loved and cherished. It can be just a portion in your home where you just make it so pleasant and so beautiful. You can you know, design it in pastel colors. You can make sure just the right amount of light, the right amount of air, all of that comes. So one of the things that you start doing when you want to put your toolbox is to create an area where you can go to when you're feeling emotionally stressed. For the children, they have, we have physical tools, we have relaxation tools, we have thinking tools, we have social tools, we have some tools which are inappropriate. We have, like for instance, things like a knife, and scissors and all that should not be kept in a uh, toolbox. And we have certain special tools. Now this is called the toolbox. So identify a nice beautiful chest or something and put all these tools into that toolbox so that you can access them readily whenever you feel you need to access it. So what are the physical tools? That will be something to help you to let off steam to get your blood circulating, to get your heart rate higher, to release your energy. So, and this is the reason why you feel better when you throw something or break something or when you're angry or frustrated. But here we do it with intention without secondary or collateral damage. So you can exercise, you can dance, you can run, cycle, do jumping jacks, push-ups, scream therapy, punch a bag, kick a ball, throw a ball. But what you need to do is in your emotional toolbox, if, if, for instance, if dancing is one, of, is one of your outlets for a physical tool, then keep some music generating thing inside the toolbox so that you can access it straight away. Or if you like playing ball, or if you like uh, dancing, or if you like can exercise, keep whatever you need for doing that in the toolbox itself. And this we do with children as well for their whatever suits them. Relaxation tools. These are activities to calm you down. It helps you to slowly release this pent up high emotional energy. So the simplest, easiest thing is listening to soothing music. You can have a spa experience. I told you a massage, a relaxing bath. All of these calm you down. You can do a repetitive activity, activity like mandala drawing, or you can do a coloring book, or you can do this. This is a beautiful concept called Zen sand drawing. This is in an actual garden, but you can have your own little tabletop Zen garden, which you can make and we can go to it and use that little rake to draw patterns on the sand. You can declutter your wardrobe or cupboard. You can play an instrument. You can take out photos and pictures that activate happy memories. So you can put all of these things into that toolbox and understand that when you're really pent up like this, it may be difficult to meditate. So don't try to meditate when you're in this high arousal state. And if you really need to try, sit absolutely quiet without moving in silence for just a few minutes. And you'll find that just that pause itself will help you to calm down. Then there are social tools where you use the support of others to manage your feelings. You call a friend, call a relative, keep all their phone numbers in a book inside your toolbox so that you know whom to call. You get, you get the number straight away. Don't keep it somewhere where you have to go and search. You may, if you have a therapist, go for a therapy session. Invite a friend over for a meal because you'll be so preoccupied in getting the meal ready, freshening the house for a guest, etc. that your own emotions will take a second uh, level. They'll go down. 
you have to set boundaries. You have to learn to say no to anything that does not serve you. This is easier said than done, but you have to learn to practice it and build it into your emotional coping. Also, you can surround yourself with people who are cheerful, make you laugh, and get your mind off your stresses. Then we've got thinking tools. This helps to manage and capitalize on your intellectual strength and to deal with the stress. So it modifies your thinking into positivity. So you can write down your negative feeling, tear it up and bur or burn the paper. That's supposed to be quite therapeutic for many people. Read something inspiring. Watch a video which lifts your spirits. Write a journal. Just empty your heart out into a journal. Do a self-audit. Ask yourself, why are you feeling this way? What triggered this emotion? Is it something I can learn to avoid in future? Can I observe the situation as a third party without blame or complaining? So sometimes when you try to sit down and analyze and label the emotion, you'll find it's not such a big deal. Then there are special interest tools. And this is where there are, there are specific things that you enjoy doing. They provide pleasure and self-satisfaction, relaxation. So it diverts your attention to do something engaging. Now, this differs for all of us. It may be arts, it may be crafts, it may be gardening, knitting, crochet, embroidery, Sudoku, crossword puzzle, jigsaw puzzle. And there is something called as the 54321 sensory activity. So when you're very stressed, what you do is sit down quietly, look around the room for five things, any five things which catch your attention. Then try and listen to any four things in the sounds that you can hear in the room. Then see if you can identify any three smells. Then see if there is something that you can touch, like some, like a, something soft or something warm or some a warm blanket in a cold room or something like that. Two things that you can touch and feel comforted by touching it. And one thing that you can taste. The thing that is commonly used for the taste is the what we used to have called the lemon drops. That's sweet because something that has got a sharp tangy taste actually is very soothing. So when you take that in your mouth and you suck it. So when you experience each of these sensations, because of the sensory neural emotion con connect, you will find that you automatically start calming down, start relaxing. Watch a movie that you like, go for a walk in nature. And when you go for a walk in nature, you can do this 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 also. Exercise there. Cuddle your pet, groom your pet, take deep breaths, do some breathing exercises, do some creative visualization. So now we've got the toolbox. We've got all these physical tools, the special interest tools, everything we've got. Now, from that toolbox, what are the activities that we can do? The self-soothing activities are all related to your sensations. That's why I said you can touch a stuffed animal, a stress ball. You can cuddle a pet. Listen. You can listen to music. You can listen to nature sounds. You can do meditation, guided meditation. Look. You can look at pretty pictures, videos, self-affirmations. You can read out affirmations. Visual imagery you can practice. Taste. So one of the mindfulness exercises which they teach in some of the meditation classes is to take just an orange. Just take one, one this thing of the orange, break it up, take just in the inside fleshy part, put just a little in your mouth and savor each of those little fleshy parts by pressing, squeezing, feeling the juice. What mindfulness does is it makes you come to the moment. Whatever is happening behind is lost. Whatever is going to happen in future is lost. You become, you start centering into the present moment. Smell, we know that there are aromatic candles, lavender candles, lavender smells, lavender agarbattis. All of these are very relaxing. Lotions, perfumes, essential oils, all of that. The next step that we do is distract ourselves. We'll identify activities which we enjoy doing, but so that we take some mind off. Then we become emotional awareness, mindfulness, and support system. Let us just take a better look at this. So something to see, the snow globe is very often used. That You know that thing when you shake like that, it will go up and come down.
because watching that slowly drop is very therapeutic. There are colored bottles which you can prepare with by adding glue and water together and putting a lot of little elements into it. And when you shake it, it will come down slowly because it's a gel form. And that is very relaxing. And aggressive children, hyperactive children, when they are given these sensory bottles, they relax completely by just looking at it and watching. So we make it nice and colorful. Something to taste can also be chamomile tea. Many people feel comfortable with mints or a sour candy. And distraction. Take your mind off the problem. So again, all these puzzles, then patterns, crochet, all this music, all of this. Another exercise which people tell you, if you don't have all that stuff with you, start counting up to 99 by threes. So three, six, nine, 12, like that. Go up, up to 99. It seems like a silly thing to do, but it's a very relaxing thing to do. Declutter your surroundings, go for a walk. Just get up and do something else. You can do the opposite action. So if you're feeling in, uh, difficult, if you're feeling some difficulty, you do something which is more positive and opposite to what you're feeling. So affirmations, guided meditation, something called asking lofty questions, which I don't have time to go into now. Inspirations, something funny, cheerful, watch a comedy or crack, uh, read a joke book, things like that, which give you a positive take on the situation. Emotional awareness, you can list it. I told you labeling your emotions is very important. So you can journal, make a chart, identify what you're feeling, label it, and you can start writing your gratitude journal. Try to focus on all that you already have because then it will make you realize that you have so much and what you're upset about is something very small in comparison. Mindfulness, Ranjini has been practicing mindfulness and teaching mindfulness for many, many years. I'm going to request her to tell you a little bit about that. But you can use various tools which help you to center or to ground. These are the sensory bottles I told you about. You can create your own sensory bottles. You just have to put uh, one, uh, one fifth glue and the rest water and then put the things into it. There are some people who feel very comfortable when they have a grounding rock or an object. When they grip that object, they feel grounded. Yoga, breathing exercises. Eat mindfully. Prepare a beautiful meal and sit down and eat it slowly, relishing every little bit of it. This makes you focus and stay in the moment. Last but not least, you have to have a crisis plan because especially anxiety, depression, aggression, violence, anger, all these emotions can sometimes get out of hand. So have the contact information in your toolbox Have so that whether you need to do it or somebody else in the family needs to do it, have the contact information of your support and resources to whom you can reach out when your coping skills are not enough. It can be family, friend. I always say that each one of us should have at least one person in our life you can call anytime for anything. So that person's contact details, your therapist, your psychiatrist, a hotline, a crisis team, the emergency room, ambulance, any of these may be necessary to access. So that too should be in your toolbox. So with that, we have told you what are the tools that you have to put into your toolbox and how to utilize that toolbox when you have an emotional crisis. Now, having the space, having the toolbox, having all the tools in one space is by itself something which is very comforting because you know when you need it, it's there for you. You can go to it. So, that is the end of the presentation. Now, I'd like to take you all through a very small cloud meditation. So can I go ahead, uh, Vijay and Ranjini? Yes, of course, Dr. Preeti Kachari. Yeah. Please, please, okay. please, please. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, uh, I request all of you to just sit in your chairs with your spine straight and your palms on your thighs. Close your eyes. Just inhale. Take a deep breath and exhale. Take a deep breath 
Inhale relaxation and exhale all your stress. Another deep breath and exhale. Visualize a beautiful cloud coming down and stopping before you. Climb onto the cloud. You are totally relaxed. It's soft, it's comfortable. And you tell the cloud, I'm ready. It floats up. It wanders here and there with no specific destination. Look around you, enjoy all that you see and let the cloud float while you relax and enjoy sitting on the cloud and being who you are. Keep doing this for a while and the destination of the cloud is a special place which only you can go to. This can be a physical space that you already know of, or it can be an imaginary space which you have created. I am going to share with you my special place to which we are going to go. So let the cloud float. You are light as air. You're comfortable. You're calm, you're relaxed. The floating cloud goes here and there and then gently descends into a little place which is so beautiful. There is a stream flowing. You can hear the splash of the water as the stream flows over the stones. There's a nice grassy shore alongside the stream. There is soft sand at the edges of the shore. You walk up to the edge of the stream and put your feet into the sand. You wiggle the sand between your toes. It feels so good. Then you walk back. There is a beautiful tree with yellow flowers. The branches are hanging down with beautiful yellow flowers. You sit down alongside the tree, lean back. You can feel the gentle warm sunlight against your skin. As you walked up to the tree, you could feel wet dew from the grass against your feet. You can hear the birds chirping. You can hear the rustle of the leaves. You can smell a beautiful flower. The yellow flowers give out a beautiful aroma. You can smell that. You can smell the grass. You can smell the water as well. Even water can have a smell. The whole atmosphere is just something that you delight in. Lie down quietly, leaning against the tree, close your eyes and just enjoy the whole image and the atmosphere. Heighten all that you can hear. Heighten whatever you can see. Heighten your ability to touch the tree, the bark of the tree, the wet grass, the warm sun against your skin. Experience all the sensations as much as you can. And just sit quietly for a little while. You continue to hear the splash of the water of the stream against the stones. You hear the birds chirping. You hear the rustle of the leaves. You feel the warm sunlight the wetness of the grass, the firmness of the bark, and you are totally safe and secure. This is your place. No one and nobody can disturb you here.
when you are totally relaxed, the cloud descends down to take you back and bring you back to this room. So climb up onto the cloud again and thank the cloud for bringing you to your special place and know that any time you need to go to your special place, you can call the cloud and it will come and take you there. So gently float up again, float back slowly, look around you, see if everything is brighter, more beautiful, more cheerful, much happier. You see happy faces everywhere. Come back slowly to the room. Let the cloud gently descend and you get off and get back into your chair. Now gently become aware of your hands, your feet and your whole body. And whenever you're ready, gently open your eyes. So thank you, MMA. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you, Ranjini. I'm so grateful. Uh, uh, this has been an initiative which I started during the pandemic under my Creative Karma banner. It's called Be Your Best With Dr. Prithika Chari. And the whole goal of that is to rewire brains, to improve mindsets, to give better health outcomes, to help people to lead balanced, happy lives and enhanced stress fitness or stress hardiness. So thank you so much. Thanks to all of you in the audience who have been listening to me. I hope you found some value in what I did today with you. I certainly did, Dr. Preeti Kachari. I didn't yes. realize all the science that goes behind a little bit of anger that I feel. How much of my brain is involved in it? Oh my God. All those names you told us, I can't even remember them. But it's not, I don't have to blame myself anymore. That's what I feel after hearing right. your talk. It's natural, it's scientific, it's the way we are wired. And I think the hope that you're giving us that we can actually have new neural pathways by teaching ourselves with all those tools in your toolbox. I love the concept of your toolbox. Thank you very much for those nicely designed corners that you want us to keep our toolbox in, virtually or physically. It was beautiful and your talk really inspires me to do something like that. All I do for the time being is I keep a Buddha right behind me. And so I think, okay, he's going to keep me calm. And that helps. But really, no, what is important here is that when we are emotionally uh, aroused or upset, we are looking for help from outside. Mm. The whole idea of this emotional toolbox is nobody is going to come and rescue you. You prepare yourself in such a way that you can rescue yourself. You pick out your tool. Yeah. Yeah. You, so you can just put all your tools, you know, you know what keeps you, gives you the, brings you back to base. Mm. And you keep it in one place so that you don't have to go search for it when you're angry. You're unlikely to go look for the right tool. Keep it all in one place and try to make that box as beautiful as possible so that you enjoy going into that nook and enjoy accessing the toolbox. Very inspiring, extremely inspiring. And I feel like your simple activities, like your sensory activity of your five, three, five, four, three, two, one, so simple, right? And, and, and brings you back to the present moment. That's what you were doing. You were teaching us to do that. And that's what mindfulness is about. Our mind is anyway full, full of past regrets, full of future fears, full of my to-do list today. But you're teaching me to be in the moment, in the zone, become aware of what you see, what you touch, what you taste, what you smell, and then you come back to the present. Beautiful, simple tool, so beautiful. And I like that you told us that we can do it even while we walk in nature. Because I think that's the new concept here for the audience. I'm sure they've heard of this maybe. They call it forest bathing in Japan. Correct, right? correct. You walk around a forest and you consciously look with all the five senses what there is in the forest. 
Forest can just be a street down Raja Namalepuram in Chennai, it doesn't matter. But it's about being present, isn't it? Thank you, that was just brilliant. Any questions that we can help with, Group Captain? Uh, yes, madam, we have got, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patika Chari. We have over 800 plus people are watching this on a Saturday evening. It's uh, absolutely, it shows that you have full power of uh, people to come and, and people, how much attention they pay to their well being is uh, really heartening to know that. And uh, we've got a number of questions. Uh, before I go to the questions, what has come from social media, let me check with uh, Lata, is also part of our committee, uh, Women's Business Council. Lata, do you have any questions you would like to interact? She's also a special invitee for this evening. Do you have any question? Uh, otherwise, we'll move on to the thing. Lata, you are there? She's there and I think on silent. I think she may be on. Her video is not uh, on. Uh, let's go with the questions what has come from uh, the social media. Here's a question from Mr. Stephen from Salem, the YouTube. He says, Madam, how do we manage amygdala, which you mentioned, and uh, which I believe is impacting all of our negativity? We react very violently at times and... Uh, do we, we can tame amygdala by training and uh, how can we control the history, historic action of amygdala? See, amygdala hijacking is something that every one of us undergo. So it's, it's the first way in which we respond to anything. And it's not a response, it's a reaction. So it takes time for us to train our amygdala no, to... It has to do its job. If it doesn't do the job, you won't be safe. You won't be protected. You will not be alert to danger. But the brain has another problem with it. It has got what is called as a natural negativity bias. Even the negativity bias is meant to keep you safe. It's a protective phenomenon. And the negativity bias is all the time looking out for danger. So even if there's no tiger in the bush, I'm all the time looking for a tiger in the bush because evolutionarily, mm. I had to look out for the tiger in the bush. Otherwise, I'll be, me, I'll be the tiger's dinner. So that is still there in our brains. But then today, I don't have to go after the tiger. I don't have to go after the uh, uh, hunting to get my meat. And I don't really have a tiger sitting. I'm comfortably sitting in my home. I'm safe. I'm protected. But Inside me, that fear is there. So any other beliefs that I have grown up with, which are associated with fear, I always use a simple example. If a dog bites you, what is your amygdala? It goes into implicit memory in the amygdala. It puts it into the memory brain, the hippocampus. And it says all dogs bite. Mm. That's what will be there. But that's not true, no. It's not necessarily true. So the response will be every time I see a dog, if I see a dog picture, whatever I see, I will think dogs bite. But my rational brain has to tell the amygdala, no, not all dogs don't bite. So that is what is called amygdala hijack. So you have to train your prefrontal cortex. That is why a lot of the brain training or rewiring training that we do are based on teaching the prefrontal cortex to do more work. I wish there was a way to zombify the amygdala so we can, we can we could no, stop. No, but it. without it, you won't be safe. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous. See, when there's a fire in the room, you will not get up and run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are some diseases which actually zombify the amygdala, like drugs, mm -hmm. addictive drugs. So they don't sense danger. They don't, don't understand the consequences of dangerous behavior. Yeah. Amygdala is very important, clients. I think you must remember amygdala always. Uh, good to do that. The then size have... of a small almond, you know, group captain. Yes, yes, Thank yes. yes, yes we have yes, so I... much trouble in here. <laughs> yes, I'm tr <laughs> truly amazing. Actually. Then uh, here's a question from Mr. Raghu from Primer 2. Uh, he says, Madam, brilliant uh, presentation. Very insightful and inspiring. I'm a senior citizen uh, of more than 65 years of age. How do I keep my memory intact uh, or enhance my memory power? Is that done by practice or any simple vitamins are available if I take my memory is intact? Uh, I, I see so many recommended in the market, Google, if I see Google. What's your recommendation? Madam? Don't take any supplements. First, have a healthy diet with a lot of fruits and vegetables. 
make sure that you have enough natural vitamins coming into you and antioxidants. The other way in which you have to stay alert is use it or lose it. Just keep using your brain. Keep doing something. Learn something new. Keep doing some puzzles. Doing some this thing. Keep active. Physically and mentally active. Physically active is also important because when you are physically active, you produce what is called as brain-derived neurotropic factor in the brain. It's called BDNF. And it actually improves your memory. It improves your brain functioning. So be physically, emotionally aligned with, the, with your body and your brain and be active physically and mentally. That is the formula for staying fine as you grow older. Again, join MMA, listen to all the events. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. Anand, Mr. Pandey is wanting to do a video and Ranjini is uh, aptly replied. So you will see them all of them in a website, or, you know, webinar recording is available. It's in YouTube, Facebook and it's all available. So anytime. Positon, I think uh, you are doing a wonderful job by sharing this with your friends and colleagues and contacts. Indeed, uh, fantastic. Then we have a question from Ms. Manubati from Nagpur. She says, how do we avoid the negative emotions uh, you know, in, uh, in us? And because how, how can we bring uh, more happiness? Uh, now, mindfulness uh, meditation helps in this regard because I keep hearing that. And uh, can you give some thoughts whom I should really approach for my mindfulness meditation? Is there any organization that does it? It is, can be done online, offline, you have used now. Ranjini is running an organization which is teaching mindfulness free for a mm -hmm. lot of people. So please get her contact details, approach her. She can support you very well. But to talk about the negative part, understand that because of the negativity bias, out of 60,000 thoughts which we have in a day, nearly 40,000 are negative. And I call them ants automatic negative thoughts. And just like these red ants, they can niggle, niggle, niggle and really be monkey brain. They can really play hell in, havoc in your brain. And it takes about five to six positive thoughts to override one negative thought. So which means you have to learn to think in that way. This the Tamil param, paramari that we have, we, you're from Nagpur, you won't understand Tamil. So there is a this thing where it says, that what came to the head went off with the cap. So you have to learn to look at life that way. So take in the good. Look for the positive in every experience of yours, even if it looks apparently negative. Because there are lessons to be learned. There are messages there. There are things you can grow from, even from a negative experience. You, you have to work at it. Brilliant, madam. Thank you so much. And... Uh... So here's a question from Ravi from Chennai. He's from Ravi is a consultant practitioner. He says, uh, Madam, you spoke about toolbox, uh, which is an excellent insight. Uh, and uh, you also mentioned about work sincerely at the office. And you also want to create some of the mood rooms, like create blue, green, yellow, red zone. Do you think in our uh, office space, uh, such a place could be created, which would employ our, uh, you know, help our employees? But this concept is not really picked up in India. What's your view? Do you think every corporate should follow this and create See, a space for the employee to relax in the environment? Actually, the snowzel and room is nothing new. It's it's very, very old and we've been using it for special children. Okay, and for people, special adults, they, it improves their interaction with people. It improves their uh, uh, speech. It start They start communicating better, etc. And also it calms them down when they are very agitated or hyperactive. And we have them in certain hospitals. I actually have been trying to set up a snow zealand room in Chennai for the past 15, 20 years. Nobody is interested. Because I said that will be a room like an emotional toolbox or like an emotional nook in your home where you can, they charge money for all kinds of things for us by experiences. You pay and go and spend one hour there when you're feeling this thing. Because you may not, you may be living in a, a, a lodging. You may be living, you may not have the access to go and settle down like that. I suggested it to some IT companies. No takers. Oh. So that is actually this blue, red, green and all is being used for 
in kindergarten schools, in, in special schools for children with special needs, we, that is there. So the child himself over time, when he's not feeling okay, goes to that zone. And that's an indication to the teacher or the parent that that particular emotion is what. So they are teaching the child to label the emotion by going to that area. Brilliant, madam. I, I think we have so many special employees in our organization. Yes, we need to really make them understand this color code and get them out of the emotions what they go through. Now, here's a question from Mr. Hagamad, uh, again from Chennai. Uh, what he says, madam, my boss told me, avoid all negative people uh, around you in your life and always be positive uh, in, in your association with the people, uh, surrounded by happiness. How is it possible always to get surrounded by the positive people in your organization? Because there'll be always somebody who will bring in uh, some negativity in you. How do we come out of such a situation, uh, be happy and bring happiness to people surrounding you? How can we create this situation? See, happiness is not something that happens to you. Happiness is what you experience. You decide to be happy first. Many of us don't decide to be happy. We're looking for happiness outside. It's actually inside you. So first and foremost, you be a happy person. Then the likelihood of people around you being happy because you'll attract the same emotion. That's one. And avoiding bad people, that is sometimes misunderstood. When we say avoid bad people, we mean avoid people who are toxic to you. Mm. Now, there are many of us in our own families, we have people who can be very toxic in the sense they're always moaning, groaning, complaining, blaming, giving excuses, totally negative behavior. And when you're around that kind of person, you also fall into the same behavior because emotions are contagious. Both good and bad emotions are contagious. We know that. So when we go to a party, we know that there are some people who really drag you down emotionally. There are some people just go stand there, don't even participate in the conversation. You feel good when you stand there. So emotions are contagious. So what you should learn to do is toxic people, sometimes we cannot eliminate, but you can distance yourself from them. Be courteous. I call it as a parallel line relationship. Good morning, good afternoon. We wish each other, we cross each other, but we don't meet. Mm -hmm. We don't need to have an interaction. You can distance yourself. So in the office, don't interact too much except the absolute necessary interaction. And, Dr. and Chidri, it's also as far as happiness is concerned, you be a happy person and automatically you'll attract happy people. Sorry. Sorry, Dr. Chari. I've also seen that you've said this. It may be somebody in the family, somebody close to you. You actually can't avoid them. It will be parallel only, but you can't avoid them because you live with them. It's okay. Correct. Even if you're living with them, you just reduce the amount of interaction and the time that you're spending. And you try to seek somebody who's calm so that you become calm. And, and you distance yourself for a short time till that person who's giving the trouble is able to sort out his or her issues. So you're absolutely... No, the other thing what we try to do is correct them. Yeah. That's the worst thing that you can do. Because there are, in my opinion, there are only three ways to solve a situation. Change the situation if you can. Change the other person if you can. Both of which are very difficult. Third change. thing is change me. So that you can do. Very true. Very very Brilliant, madam. Yes. We get so many comments, we just lop it out and move on. <laughs> then we have another question from uh, Ms. Raja from Chennai. Raja Lakshmi from Chennai, sorry. She said, madam, uh, you spoke about cloud meditation, which is so interesting. Many times we stay at cloud nine, uh, immensely happy about what we achieve. <laughs> Is it okay yeah. to stay all the time at cloud nine? Does it uh, bring in a lot of positive and good energy or come back to mother earth? What's your advice? Man? Learn to go into cloud nine whenever you need to. And then you have to keep your feet grounded on the earth anyway. Otherwise, you can't go through your life if you're in cloud nine all the time. Lata joined. Lata, do you have any question? You have to unmute yourself, Lata. Um, yes, I do. Have, uh, I was outside, so I'm in a mask. So I do have a question. I do. Uh, has my question been asked already, Captain? I written to you. Can I ask it now? Please ask. Please, please go ahead. Uh, we are often surrounded by uh, people who are stressed. 
So more than taking care of ourselves, sometimes we have to take care of somebody else. And we often don't know how to react to extreme stress around us. So can you guide us as to how we can handle people? What is the correct thing to do? Because we don't want to aggravate the situation, right? That's a difficult situation. And uh, sometimes in, in our experience, especially in neurology, this is a problem which many caregivers of people with Alzheimer's disease and certain, you know, because a lot of neuro neurological disease, a lot of it has got disability. Okay, so the person is usually irritable, stressed, and, you know, where they've been active people who suddenly have to live with a disability. And they can be quite difficult to manage, actually. And the caregivers can be under tremendous stress. So sometimes I think the mistake is that we are constantly trying to correct them, which they resent more. So okay. sometimes it's just better to go along with it. Yeah, right. I know it's bothering you. I understand. But unfortunately, there's nothing I can do for you right now. Right. Let us just sit down. Let us both calm down. Let us listen to some music. Let us, you know, have, do something. Let us, why don't we sit and, uh, you know. And one very calming activity, I'll tell you, which is very easy for any home to do, is just mix up a lot of the, you know, uh, take uh, 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 dals and the rice, uh, dals or something rice or something, and ask them to separate that. It takes so much focus to do that that you completely calm down. We use that very effectively, and or you can keep, in fact, with you. You can have shells, kuti, so chori, la. You can have those. You can have little shell, a collection of cells, uh, or collected a uh, colored store, uh, you know, little pebbles and things like that. You can have that as your calming bag and you put it in a plate and make them, why don't we do this? I'll also do it with you. So you just change the subject. That, that's all you have to do. And you'll find that most of the time this works. It won't work all the time. And there are some people who require medication to control their agitation, but that's a different Brilliant, madam. One last question. We've got three more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that answer. Thank you. Thank you, Lata, for joining. And one last question for the evening uh, before we let you go, Dr. Pita. We've been, we, we don't want to let you go. We want to keep talking to you and get so. But I think all programs come to end as for the timing, you know, timing, discipline of MMA. The last question is from uh, Mr. Pradeep, uh, again from Chennai. Uh, he talked about yoga and meditation. Madam, my mind is not calm and think all about various activities uh, when I do my yoga. And especially my boss come into my memory every time I do yoga. How do I avoid this? <laughs> okay. See, one of the ways in which mindfulness works is you have to start being mindful of everything you do. That's one of the ways to get into the mindful state. So when you brush your teeth, for instance, focus completely on the brushing of the teeth. Think of the brush going over your teeth. Imagine it cleaning it, feel it go over your gums, feel the uh, toothpaste frothing in your mouth. All, you see, that is mindfulness, actually. That's how mindfulness is developed. And that's what is, it's once you start doing that and start doing everything mindfully, what is mindfulness? It means 100% focus on whatever is happening or you're doing at that moment. The whole purpose of mindfulness is to teach you to be in the present moment. And when you said yoga, what I would suggest you do is, uh, what I do when I, I used to go to the gym, now I don't go, but I do yoga. So what I always do when I exercise is, maybe because I'm a doctor, I'm able to visualize it better. I actually visualize that muscle contracting and relaxing. And you know, my whole focus is on that muscle or whatever I'm working. So I feel that, you know, that tightness or the pain or whatever that is that. So my attention is so fully focused on the movement or the, this thing. That's a kind of mindfulness. So then your other thoughts will not come. And why is it your boss comes? I mean, do you and your boss not get along or what? Or do you get along very well for you to be thinking so lovingly about him when you're doing yoga? So what, and meditation, another mistake people make is they think you should not have thoughts. 
Yes. The way to think of meditation is I'm sitting at a table in the office. It's an open office. Okay. I'm doing work. Every day, 10 people walk up and down across the, uh, across a bypass my table. Most initially, yes, when I start working, I'll notice A event, B event, C event. After a while, when I'm doing my work, somebody may come and say, hey, did you see so-and-so? No, I don't know. Oh, but he just walked past your table. So that is what thoughts do to you in your meditation. So initially, you'll notice the thoughts coming. Don't fight it. Let them come. After a while, you'll find that as you keep focus on, simple thing is to focus on your breath. You'll find that as long as you're only observing the air coming in and going out, coming in and going out, you'll find all those thoughts just go away. You don't notice them. When you fight it, they will come and stick in your head much more. Anything you resist will insist on being with you. Brilliant, madam. Mr. Pradeep, thinking about boss, not only while doing yoga, even uttering MAY program question is boss really confused, madam. <laughs> Need some serious attention. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, madam. It's a fascinating Thank evening. Uh, uh, with Ranjini permission, we would like to present a memento because you are an MMA. We would have done something different. Since you are separated, uh, uh, Ranjini, you would like to give a closing comments after that on behalf of you and on behalf of the MMA Managing Committee and all the members who would like to present a memento to uh, Pritika. Ranjini, for your closing yes. comments. Yes. So, Pritika, Dr. Pritika Chari, just amazing. The talk so quickly you gave us such a fund of information and so many simple ways to put it to our toolbox. Whether it's the physical relaxation and release tool, whether it's the relaxation tool, the social tool you talked about, having at least one go-to person, simple things. Thinking tools, that's the mindfulness meditation, prioritizing meditation, and then special interest tools. Beautifully, you gave us all the tools to put into a box. And I'm so happy to be with you. Can I be your toolbox carrier for the rest of my life, please? Oh, thank you so much. That's such a wonderful thing. I have a person in my life who really, I can call any time for anything. And I feel everybody must have one person at least. If you have many, you're lucky. But each one of us should have at least one person. Because very famous people, I mean, you take uh, somebody like uh, Steve Jobs, he did mindfulness meditation 30 minutes every day. He died at 56, but look how much he achieved, right? So all of us were, are not fuddy daddies when we decide to just be. The B stands for begin your day with meditation and the E stands for end your day with gratitude journaling, both of which Dr. Pritika Chari told us so beautifully. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to have been part of this program. Thank you. Brilliant, madam. And thank you so much, Dr. Pitika Shari. It's always a pleasure interacting with you. And I had the privilege of knowing you for the last so many years, I think over 40 years now. And it's always, I, I, every time I meet you and walk away, I get really inspired. And uh, as a token of our appreciation, and we would like to present you this, what we do uh, under these circumstances, it will be very useful. On your behalf, we will go to present you on the face mask uh, to the needy people. Uh, this is what uh, MMA does. We go around the people. Because of people like you come and speak on MMA platform, which inspires so many people, our team goes around the area surrounding MMA. We present them various masks and also give them vaccination drive. We give them food at times, we teach them night tuition. All that we are able to do it because outstanding speakers like you come and speak and inspire a large number of MMA members. Thanks so much. Indeed, privilege and honor to have you with us on MMA platform. We'd like to look forward to seeing you more. MMA. Thank you, Dr. Ranjini Manian, for uh, standing in at the last moment. It's, uh, it's always uh, fantastic to have you as a chairperson, being the best in you. I, I got so many comments in our box uh, about the way you presented the whole thing, and, and they, they really appreciate your accent, your presentation. I think they have, you have picked up a lot of fans this evening today. <laughs> I can tell you that. Thanks so much, and uh, really appreciate If you need of sponsorship you. of anything, please approach me. Thank you so much. Food or masks or whatever. Thank you so much and uh, indeed uh, delighted and honored. Uh, thanks so much to all the viewers watching this program live. And if any of your friends have missed it, don't worry. Please share them the YouTube link and other links are available. And the presentation somebody want to share, you can watch the, the presentations there on your YouTube and oh, thing because the uh, exactly. uh, presentation, we never tell the, uh, the facilitator or the speaker to share it because it's a personal creativity which they have created over a period of putting in lots of effort to that. I think nobody will go to try no, share the presentation so easily. And notwithstanding, you can watch them on YouTube and Facebook, Twitter, everything is available. Thanks so much, members. Uh, you are the inspiration for us to bring you some outstanding program week after, day after, month after, month after. Thanks so much for joining this evening. Bye-bye.
good night till we meet again see you on monday evening another interesting event live at mma pulavar indran is going to talk about the art of management thank you good night thank you good night